And we're back, folks, to another episode on the MVM Show. And I'm pumped to talk to you guys today about this book that I found at an estate sale. It's called The Duck Hunter's Bible, and it's written by Erwin A. Bauer. Actually, you've heard of this guy. Kind of a legend of his time. It's copyrighted in 1965, and there's so many things. I think I'm going to do two or three episodes on this book. I don't know if you guys have ever listened to Jock Willenick. He's a former Navy SEAL, and uh, he was a trainer, too, as well. Did tons of great things. And he has a podcast, and he'll read a book, and then he'll come in later and read excerpts and then comment on those. And I've never done that on here, but I thought that was a really good idea, and I'm not going to make a habit of doing this, but maybe when I'm running solo, I think there's some really interesting things that you guys would like to hear out of this book, how things were done in the 60s, the 50s and 60s, and how our mindset and our concept of how things are supposed to be, how they should be, what's right, what's wrong, um, ethicality, just standardization of what our day and time and the era that we live in says what is right. Really, there's a lot of things in this book that you'd be surprised that are totally different and um, are, they don't go at all off of uh, basically what this book um, says they did back in the 60s. And I think what happens is that generational ebbs and flows and how people think things, what people have heard, what people have said, uh, what media, not media, but like social media has really done. I think, in my opinion, it's created a little bit of er- a lot of, I say a little bit, a lot of arrogance in the waterfowl community, and I hope that changes one day for the better, and I would like to be a part of that to make that better, um, and I'm going to talk about it later on towards the end. I'm going to just read little pieces out of this, because uh, I think you guys will think it's really in- interesting. Before I do, I want to remind you, please subscribe to the YouTube channel if you watch the MVM show on YouTube the, hit the subscribe button. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. <clears throat> we are 39 people away, subscribers away from hitting 1,000. I just need to hit that 1,000 mark. I really, I didn't used to push it before, but we're so close now. I'm really trying to push it and just hit the mark. And for those of you that have, thank you so much for supporting it. Even though I know probably a lot of you don't even watch it on the YouTube channel. You probably just listen to it on Spotify or Apple Podcast or whatever platforms that you listen to podcasts on. But without further ado, I just wanted to mention that and throw that out there. Let's get this started. All right. Here it is. For those of you watching on the YouTube channel, this is what the book looks like. The Duck Hunter's Bible by Erwin A. Bauer. And he's actually wrote the Bass Fisherman's Bible and the Saltwater Fisherman's Bible. And then there's a Trout Fisherman, Upland, Varmint, and Crow Hunter's Bible written by different authors. Really neat book. I took this up camping. Anyways, we went to an estate sale. I got this book. It says back in 1965, this was $1.95 for this book. There's so much good stuff. There's so many good pictures. They talk about decoy spreads. So many things that guys invent. Like I'm looking at page uh, 89. It looks just like Tangle Free 360 blind. But, you know, companies now like, oh, first ever, this is what we've created. And if you go back, I mean, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. So wise verbiage from the the word of God Bible, but they got all kinds of like boat blinds, all kinds of neat stuff in here, but I'm going to, I got a few things I want to talk about. So let's go ahead and start out. And I think this will get you guys pumped for season. Just this little excerpt right here that I'm going to read for you on page 10. Here we go. Because of the overcast, the ducks came in low, just above the ground. There seemed to be no end to them. Several times they practically brushed the canvas with their wings. Others just materialized out of nowhere. Some kind of natural radar guided them. This is something I kept thinking that should happen to every duck hunter on earth. It was certainly an incident I would never forget. But to tell you the truth, the sport of duck hunting is a series of events a man will never forget. The wonderful world of duck hunters is something special and something different. It isn't the same as the trout fisherman's world because trout fishing is more contemplative and is associated more often with pleasant weather. Nor is duck hunting as grueling and intense as typical big game hunting or big game fishing can be. But it has some elements of all these plus escape, tradition, suspense, and a tremendous uncertainty. Duck hunting gives a man a chance to see the loneliest places. Non-duck hunters who wouldn't understand might call these the unfriendliest places. 
I mean, blinds washed by a rolling surf, blue and gold autumn marshes, a north bay with ice forming on the perimeter, a rice field in the rain, flooded pin oak forest or any remote river delta. In duck hunting, the scene is as important as the shooting, at least it is for me. The scene might even be completely unreal. My best example recalls an evening not long ago in Baja, California. Glenn Lau and I were sitting together beneath a thorn bush on a narrow finger of gravel beach. The beach separated the salty sea of Cortez near Laredo from a murky green brackish lagoon. There you go. The scenes that you see. There's a couple pictures in here, a guy holding about three or four birds. He's silhouetted with birds flying in the background, sun setting. Guys, we all know, any duck hunter knows, the things that we've seen is is phenomenal. The sun sets, the sun rises, the experiences we've had, just like he says right here. And I just thought that kind of rung, rung a bell in my mind, in my waterfowl's mind, just how neat it is. What the things that we can see and hear in his perspective back in the 60s, the 50s and 60s when he was hunting. On page 12, it says, A day... In a duck blind can make serious hunters, even addicts, out of otherwise normal outdoorsmen. So true. I got plenty of people that are big time, big game hunters, and there has been something different about duck hunting that is done to these guys. This is a sport in which, for the best results, you get up long before daybreak and remain out in the elements when they are the worst. There are duck hunters who will disagree, but on the average, shooting is best when the weather is least pleasant. The influence of duck hunting on men is also evident in the great amount of money spent every year to pursue the sport. Today, most of the very best waterfowl hunting areas are leased or owned outright by duck hunting clubs. Some of these amount to no more than the legal papers which describe the lease or ownership, but far more are fairly elaborate clubs and many border on the luxurious. Depending on how elaborate the establishment, membership in a duck hunting club can be downright expensive. Besides the club building, buildings, a number of boats, guides, dogs, decoys, food, and bar supplies are necessary. In many cases, there is also the matter of constant maintenance of dikes, channels, and water levees with heavy equipment. Obviously, the expense is great, but so are the rewards. A day in a duck marsh means much to many men, and the cost isn't the greatest consequence. Recently, an official of an automotive... Recently, an official of an automobile company told the writer that the ducks he bagged one season cost him $1,238.98 per pound of meat, but it was worth it. <laughs> I love that, but it was worth it. I don't really know how much he figures that it costs that much because let's say if you killed 150 birds, I'm, I might be a little unfair to say 150 pounds of meat. Let's just say like 100 pounds. And then I think of the fuel. Yeah, I don't know if it would be that much, but boy, I bet you it's up there. Maybe we just don't want to know, right? Maybe we don't want to count the cost. But I love how he says, but it was worth it. All right, in page 14, we're talking about identification. Give me a second here. Got an itch in my eye. Let's digress a moment and see exactly what is involved in identifying ducks and geese. You can look for color and pattern of plumage, of course, and if the ducks are near enough and not in motion, this is a good way. But knowing plumage and color isn't enough. I love this part. That's why I'm reading it right now. Besides, many ducks wear different plumage in summer called eclipse plumage than they do in spring and fall. This accounts for such a confusion as hunters identifying male ducks as females early in the hunting season. Often during this period, drakes haven't had time to regain their normal plumage and the summertime molt. There are other factors which confuse identification. Adult birds are likely to vary slightly from immature birds, and even chemical or mineral content of water can change a duck's color. White-breasted ducks, for example, may show up as yellow or brown after lengthy exposure to a mineral-laden pond. The complete duck hunter does not rely on plumage alone to guide him. Instead, he checks the habitat, the action or behavior, the shape or silhouette, and the voice of the bird. Some birds can positively be identified by voice, the woody for one example. Others, such as the Drake Pinto, can posit 
be positively identified by shape no matter what the stage of his plumage. The antics and maneuvers of a flock of waterfowl in the air can help indicate many species, mallards, pintails, widgeon, from loose groups. Sometimes the individual birds in a flock seem to be going in all directions at once, although aiming at the same place. Teal and shovelers flash past in small, marvelously coordinated groups, fire at them or startle them, and the groups seem to explode, regrouping again later on. So I like how he says this. You don't just identify by looking because there's going to be days when it's overcast and it's dark. And honestly, it's really hard to tell the difference between a drake and a hen. Mallard, because you're just seeing the silhouette. You got to let them get in super close and super tight. And you may have to pass shots. When we were in Washington one year, the clouds rolled in. It got really overcast and we really were struggling. We had to really, really wait, wait and pass up good shot opportunities to get that right angle to where we could see the plumage and see, okay, that's a drake. And even then we shot a couple of hens. Not that it's a crime, but we shot a couple of hens. We were wanting to shoot the drakes. And it was just because, you know, that we fully couldn't see is that a drake or a hen and then they turn and you shoot and you know it's a hen it's again it doesn't matter i mean we shot one or two hens a piece but i just thought just remember if you're hearing that drake whistle that just you know that's an identifier and that's what helped us a lot i know during that day because of the experience that we have um in other situations when you got multiple varieties of birds you're looking at the wing beat, the speed of the wing beat. You're looking at the profile of the bird, the outline of the bird. Um, you're looking at the sounds it makes, the groups that it's in. You're looking at all these things. You're not just trying to see the color of the feathers. And that just comes over time with more experience. I thought um, on a bird, specific bird, and they go over all the identification of all these birds, but on page 25, they don't even call it a widgeon. They say it's another name for it, but they call it the bald pate. So I thought that was really cool. Talking about the widgeon, the bald pate is another of those ducks with many names. Among them are widgeon, American widgeon, bald-headed widgeon, northern widgeon, bald duck, French teal, gray duck, poacher duck, robber duck, whistler, and white belly. However, bald pate and widgeon are most widely used, with the former coming from the pure white top of the head and dra- on the drakes. It is true that many American gunners do not rate bald plates very highly. However... I have enjoyed some memorable days with them in the marshes around the western shore of Lake Erie and consider bald pates extremely fine game birds and good table birds as well. They fly swiftly in small compact flocks in an irregular formation. They set, seldom fly directly from one place to another, but instead making twists and turns and other fancy maneuvers that make shooting on a windy day an extremely exciting proposition. I just thought that was pretty cool. All right, on page 61... We're going to a different type of bird and one that me and Target, uh, t- Target, me and Thomas are going to target this year. At least that's our goal. And it's a small window in California to Target. And that is the Black Brant. And I, we've been, we were going to do this last year, but our schedule didn't work out. I mean, I'm telling you what, me and Tom sit down right before season, about a month out from season, and we literally write out almost a complete schedule for the whole year. And that's why, like, I know people have asked to go with this, or, and I'm not talking about close friends or people we see all the time. I'm talking about people that, um, that we, we don't know personally, and that's, it's not that we don't want to hunt with other people, but, like, I, I've said this a lot. I don't even really get to hunt with people, friends of mine, that I've known my whole life. And it's not because I don't want to hunt with them either. And I think sometimes maybe it bothers them. Like, man, I don't know why you don't go with us or want to go with us. It definitely is not that. I promise you. It's not that I don't want to go with you. But me and Thomas hunt a ton together. And we just make our plans at the very beginning of season. And we travel a lot. And we got things planned this year. We're actually going to be at the Heavy Shot Factory in Oregon. So we will be in Oregon this year. And we will hunt in Oregon. Um, I'm kind of throwing out some some little nuggets here, but I feel like I kind of like throwing little things that I normally don't throw out in the channel because I feel like this is such a tight knit group of people that listen to this, that I almost like giving you guys sneak peeks before I say or do anything, but we will be in Oregon this year and we are going to be hunting with um, Mario from final approach. And then we're going to be doing our own thing and we're going to be doing some stuff with heavy shot. Can't wait to show you guys what we're doing there, but that, that will be this year. So really excited about that. 
and um, the great group of people. I mean, honestly, the people at Heavy Shot are so, they become my friends. And that's what I love is having those kind of relationships. But um, that's kind of some of the traveling that we're going to be doing, plus all our stuff that we have planned. I don't think the Flyways Collective thing, um, I know Josh from Outdoor Limits was mentioning he would really like to get me out there to do a couple kayak hunts, a couple days of kayak hunting layouts and kayaks. And honestly, I really want to do that. Like, I really want to do that. I've, one of my favorite videos of Josh's is when he's he in his kayaks or the, the little, the small, small little like boats. I, I'm calling it a boat, but it's like a layout with the little motor on it. I really want to do that. Um, I've really thought about getting that kind of set up for myself for different areas um, separate of the boat because it's totally different. You can get it in a lot smaller places, a lot more subtle. And anyways, I might. I've thought of that. He invited me. It's in the back of my head. I love watching those videos when he does that. And I really, once he mentioned that, I was like, oh, I didn't want to add any more trips to the schedule, but I might do that last minute if he's got some spots he wants me to come up on. So anyways, those are the plans. And Brant is one of them. The Black Brant, and I just wanted to read a, a little little excerpt from this real quick. Black Brant, the Black Brant, which is very similar in appearance and habits to the American Brant, is confined to the Pacific coast. It nests along the north shore of Alaska and eastward toward the McKenzie Delta of Canada. It winters along our Pacific coast from Puget Sound southward through Baja, California. In the latter place, I have found it abundant along sand beaches where fast evening shooting is possible as late as March. And, and I'm, I'm reading some of this because I'm telling myself this because there's some little tips he's throwing in here. Like, you can definitely do evening shooting with them. So not just morning, but evening as well. And then one thing I like he says, and I'll read that in a second, about how he cooks them and how really supposedly good table fare they are. So it kind of gets me excited. I've never hunted them before, and um, they're on my bucket list. So we're really going to try to make that happen this year. Um, and do it here in California, maybe even run over to the Oregon coast. I don't know, but probably just California coast. Um, and we've been doing our studying. And look, guys, this is what we've said. For those of you that want to try new places this year, you got to do your research. Books like this, you got to make notes. Okay, this is what they say about this. This is the food they like. This is where they like to be. This is the time of day that's best, which most waterfowl is morning and evening, right? Sometimes some birds aren't good in the evening. There's a couple bird species that I really think – you don't really never do that good in the evening. And to me, one of them out on the West Coast out here is teal. Now, that depends on the weather. If the weather is crazy and gnarly, but if it's sunny bluebird day, I've noticed a lot of times you won't really get the, the teal, green wing teal moving out in the afternoon as much as you do in the morning. I'm not saying you don't shoot them. I've shot plenty in the afternoon on cloudy, windy days, whatever. But anyways, um, again, it's waterfowl. Don't quote me on some site saying Ty said you can't shoot green wing till in the afternoon um as pointed out before it is very difficult to distinguish the black brant from the american brant but there is no point in explaining the difference in detail the birds simply are never seen together the flight of the bl black brant is fast as the birds move with rapid wing strokes and often travel very close to the water it frequently changes elevation probably moving up and down with existing wind currents during flight it offers a low guttural sound that almost resembles a growling like the American brown, it is delicious on the table. Listen to this. This has made my mouth start to water. Perhaps the most delicious single waterfowl meal I can remember occurred the golden evening. Glenn Lau and I sat in camp beside a lonely Baja California lagoon in the rapidly falling night. Tired from a long day of driving over a rocky road and primed with tequila, we broiled the fillets. Listen to this. This gives me a good idea cooking waterfowl in general. We broiled the fillets of several brant over an open fire while basting them with lime juice and olive oil. No duck, in fact, no game at all, ever tasted any better. <laughs> I love that. And I never thought about doing lime and olive oil. I watched this guy on YouTube, Mark Weens. He's probably like 9 million subscribers. Dude, the guy makes amazing uh, videos on all his travels of all the food he eats all around the world it's if you if you if you like that kind of stuff he's not a cook he knows a lot about food but man he goes to the places where they just eat this food and i'm telling you i'll i'll grab a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and just pretend i'm there with him <laughs> well i'll be eating watching him while i'm eating lunch or whatever it is i mean i'm like oh my goodness man he just did a series on steak it was unreal 
makes me want to go there is from Spain. So now I never had intention to go to Spain, but maybe I will go there one day for the for the meat. That's for sure. But lime juice and olive oil. I mean, that's so simple with some salt. But man, I was like, man, that actually sounds like a good idea. I think, you know, what would be good like that. Because I will tell you what, one of the best pieces of duck I've ever had. Shout out to Josh from Outdoor Limits. Check out his podcast, Duck Gun Podcast. These guys. And um, Foul Front with Matt. And by the way, Matt never responded. So now I know, officially know, Matt does not listen to this podcast. So... I'm not going to hold it against you, Matt, but it is it is a little bit hurtful. Um, and I'm going to keep throwing this in all season. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, well, the best I ever had, uh, Josh from Outdoor Limits, He we shot a pintail that day. I can't remember if I, who shot that. But it had a good amount of fat on it, so we plucked it, did the breast, kept the fat on it, and we cooked it over an open flame with some oak wood, I believe. Oh, my goodness. It was the best duck. I, I literally look back to us ask Thomas too he was there we were doing a flyways collective deal it was by far the best duck I've ever had the fat was crispy the meat was so good cooked medium 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 rare oh but I will say Matt cooked um honker was it honker yeah it was um and he calls it the prime rib style basically cooked very very rare on flame and i'm thinking you know what if i go early goose i'm gonna definitely try to cook one of the one of the geese like this right here i'm gonna try to do open flame with lime juice olive oil and salt uh, because olive oil if you really think it and look at a lot of places they real a lot of people really cook a lot with olive oil and they man when they'll get done cooking like in spain they just dump olive oil all over it. it's crazy but um i really got me to thinking i think that's a good thing to throw in so anyways that that if we you can shoot two pieces in California, I want to save one for eating and and one for the freezer um, to send to the tax terms. Actually, I'll probably just have Travis do it. And uh, by the way, hit Travis up, Grasslands Tax Term of California, if you need any tax terming done. All right, let's move on from Brant. We're almost gonna wrap this one up. Uh, let's go to page eighty. And it's kind of talking about the flyways and how that it, it looks like somewhere around that time, not um, the flyways really haven't been around forever, obviously, but they're separating the flyways here. And some, it seems like it, the way he talks is almost something newer. Back in 1965, duck hunters and waterfowl biologists often use the terms flyway and migra migration routes. This is a good time to explain the difference between them. A flyway is a vast geographic region with its own breeding area and wintering grounds. The two widely separated places are connected by a system of migration routes. In other words, a certain species will follow a certain migration route within its flyway when traveling from breeding to wintering areas in the fall. With only a few exceptions, they return northward by the same routes in the springtime. Each flyway has its own populations of waterfowl, even of species that are distributed completely across the continent or around the world. Of course, the breeding grounds of more than one flyway greatly overlap. And during the nesting season, large areas are occupied by birds of the same species but of different flyways. The flyway maps in this chapter will explain more of this detail. Many veteran waterfowlers, this is the part I really wanted to bring up. It wasn't so much about the flyways, but about migration patterns. Many veteran waterfowlers will find it hard to believe, but the state of the weather has far less to do with the migrations of birds than is commonly believed. We're always looking for the north to freeze and, and cool down in Canada. Yes, I know that has a factor because there's a survival rate there, right? They've got to move south. But listen, he, what he says, these birds got to migrate. That is in their DNA. They have to do it. They will do it, whether or not the weather is bad. There may not be as many birds as migrate because of the weather, but they had to migrate. I have known old duck hunting guides who felt they could predict the arrival of certain duck species by consulting a barometer in the long-range weather prediction. But any successful predictions are likely to be coincidental. According to the most waterfowl biologists, migration, migrations begin and end in obedience to mysterious psychological promptings and have no relationship 
to prevailing weather conditions. Of course, a severe storm or a sudden freeze may force ducks to move elsewhere, possibly further south to survive. But annual migrations are a vital part of a wild duck's life cycle, and they have become adjusted to correspond with major seasonal changes. The serious waterfowler can use a knowledge of migration routes and approximate dates to his own advantage. Let's assume he lives in Central City and hunts on Central River sloughs. Every year, as accurately as possible, he keeps a chart on the arrival dates of fresh flights of mallards or pintails or whatever. Pretty soon, he has an accurate record compiled over several seasons, and a quick glance will reveal at which periods the odds for shooting are most in his favor. He can do better he can better plan his trips and also make better use of his time he has available for hunting. Dude, guys, this is why we record. This is why we write stuff down. That's why I use freelance hunt stats. Well, I think it's American, the American waterfowler now. Or, and I just bought some, some like uh, waterfowl diaries, or they call it journals. I actually ordered the wrong one. I ordered the big game one. I meant to order the waterfowl one, so I got to send them back and get my money back. It's from Public Pursuit. So it's like actually a really nice leather bound, soft leather bound book um, that you can write in. Um, let me pull it up on my phone because the one I got is not the one that I I wanted. I wanted, and I got the one I got because the, the color of the leather. Um, I can't remember the name of that one. It's pecan, I think. But if you go on Instagram, they might be on Facebook too. Public Pursuit. Let me go pull them up. I emailed them actually. Let them know what happened. I, I got to get a hold of them, but it's a holiday, so. Probably won't hear from till tomorrow, but but guys, I want to highly point out that you really should um log these things because I agree. There's certain times of the year that I feel like it's just good no matter what. It just duck hunting is good on those days, and it has been for several years because there are sp- specific days that I just know, and I've been hunting on those days for the last four years specifically and it's always good i always do good it and not always has the weather been gnarly or bad so it's just i feel like there's certain times of year but anyways public pursuit and in the waterfowl one here that's a little slow right now uh that picture is not very good there it goes okay it's called the waterfowl journal and it's a great gift man it's a good gift you're looking for a gift to buy like your buddy or your friend or your family member or somebody, man, it's a really great gift. I, I probably will buy some more of these and hand them out. But here's the info. The, and like I said, the American Waterfowler app that Elliot uh, created, it, it's it's really just as good. as There's a few things in here that they don't have, but you could put them in the notes. So I'm not trying to steer you away, but if you like to write something out and open it in a book form, this is a great way to do it. So it's got general info. Alarm. When you set your alarm, and I, I like this because it just kind of, do I need to know when I woke up? Not really, but like looking back, like, okay, this is what the commitment was, and this is what I did. I like it. So it's got what time your alarm went off, what time you arrived to your setup, what time you were done with your setup, the shooting time, the ending outing, like what time you left. It has location where you can fill in dogs, dog or dogs, people in your group, Weather conditions section, and then it's temperature, wind, visibility, yes or no on a cold front, water conditions, muddy, clear, uh, water levels, like one foot, shin deep, knee deep, whatever. It does, This is what I really like too right here. It, it says moon, full, quarter, half, or three quarters, and then anyone get wet, which I think is funny. If anybody fell in the water, got wet or whatever, but I really like the moon thing. That's such a big factor. Then down by report, it's got total birds seen, which I like because if you didn't limit and you shot four birds, but it was because your shooting was bad and you thought, well, I didn't do that good there, but you've seen 5,000 birds and you just missed your opportunities, you need to know that stuff. So it has total birds seen, total birds taken, male and female, you write in, species taken, so mallard, teal, gadwall, whatever it is. Then it has number of birds flared. I like that. So, so, like, maybe my setup wasn't good, or maybe I wasn't hitting good enough. Number of shells shot, so you can track your shooting. Any migration groups, yes or no. Decoy spread, and I like this because it says number of decoys used. 
and motion yes or no, and then it has a little box where you can draw in your decoy spread, how you set it up. That way, if you do it again in this situation, you're like, that didn't really work. This is what worked, and this is how we had it. I think it's amazing. I, I really like this. I'm a, In fact, I'm going to send this to Elliot and them and think, man, is there a way you can integrate some of this stuff? I know they got lots of plans, but... So that all, I said all that, public pursuit. Let me give you their website if you guys, I'm sure some of you want to go check this out and order some. The, actually, and if you can, they don't know me, but say Mid Valley Mercenaries sent you. I don't know, just to let them know, like I'm trying to help them out. I mean, they just, it's not like they have a bunch of stuff they would, you know, whatever. I'm not trying to get nothing out of this. Just say you sent me. All right, see you guys. But thepublicpursuit.com. The, T H E publicpursuit.com and they're out of Tuscaloosa 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 Alabama so check them out really neat they do other things too I think they have big game they have different types of journals that you can buy but it's pretty cool all right last but not least and we'll end this podcast now we're already 30 minutes I always go longer than I say uh 83 okay now this last part is going to end on something that I'm I'm bringing this up because in 1965 someone said something. I've we've had a lot of comments over the years. Pass shooting, all he did is pass shoot. Blah blah blah. And I respect people. We just had Kirk McCullough on the podcast. He's a legend. You guys, if you haven't heard that episode, check it out. He goes, I never pass shoot ducks. Um, I only shoot ducks and decoys, or I don't shoot them at all. I totally respect that, and I don't take nothing to that. Um. But, and I know a lot of people are like that and that feel that way, but if I could ever encourage anybody to have that standard, that's exactly what I would do. But I do not think you are wrong for passing ducks. Quote, unquote. You can use that on whatever form you want. It is not ethically wrong to pass shoot ducks. Now, the part that's not going to be brought in if someone tries to change anything on me is the fact when I say that, and I'm going to read you what he says in here, okay? This is a guy from the 1960s. Everyone tries to say old school. I'm old school. I don't do this. I don't do that. It's like, no, don't blame it on old school. Don't blame it on the old days. Guys, in the old days, if you research, and I've been reading a lot of these old books, if you research and you look in the old days, Guys were shooting ducks out of blo- out of out of uh, deer stands, or they would make deer stands up in trees in the timber and shoot them out there to get higher, to get more elevated. Guys were making. I've seen the pictures myself, black and white, of guys putting because birds were they were past shooting birds, and they were shooting at them instead of wanting to shoot at them so high when they're passing over at sixty yards. They put these little platforms in the tops of trees so they could shoot them more level going by. But they were always pass shooting. They didn't put decoys out. They found an area where birds were crossing and passing through. They would get up in this tree thing. I, I'll, uh, if I can find that picture, I don't remember where I seen that. It might have been this book, actually, or it was online. And they're still to this day, though they're still up in those trees. I've seen, oh, I know where it was. It was that RK, R, R, RK Graves. He's been on the podcast before. I need to have him back on again and talk about this stuff. But they would build these little platforms in the top of these tall trees and just shoot birds as they go over. Be- now that so they're not, instead of 60 yards, maybe they're only 20 yards, 40 yard, 30 yards going over them. And if they were even higher, they're higher up in this tree to get more shots. So don't tell me pass shooting is a crime. Don't tell me pass shooting is unethical. Don't tell me pass shooting, uh, the old school guys don't do that. If you don't pass shoot, that's because that is the choice you have made, and I respect that. I totally respect that. I don't think it's wrong at all that you went that way, but don't push that off on other people and try to act like other people are bad or they're lesser of a duck hunter. Let me read you this excerpt from what he says. This is basic duck hunting. This is in the chapter 80, uh, of basic duck hunting, page 83. It may seem a very elementary statement to experienced duck hunters, but day in and day out, the shooting is best very early and late in the day. This is because of, the, because of the habit of flying from resting to feeding areas and back again at these two periods. I have enjoyed good shooting at high noon, but only rarely. 
It's better to spend middays elsewhere elsewhere than in a cold blind. Take a nap. Burn up some ammo on clay pigeons or make a recon to see where the ducks are resting. A session or two with the clay targets is a great practice for any duck hunter, both before and during the open season. With a hand trap and a couple of cases of birds, Frank Sayers and I toss all conceivable angles for the others to shoot. The crossing shots so common in duck hunting can be easily duplicated by tossing the clay targets directly across in front of the shooter. Overhead shots, both from behind and from the front, can also be duplicated by standing behind and higher than the shooter or in, or in a defilade in front of him. We've, duplica- we've duplicated the high-passing shots. Did you hear that? We've dupli- duplicated the high-passing shots of ducks by tossing targets out the second-floor window of an old barn. We have also practiced shooting from a sitting position, a highly valuable drill if your plans including float tripping for ducks by boat. Did you hear what he said? Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan. Now, he does what he wants. That's on him. He did say high passing shots. I don't know what yardages he's talking about and referring to, but he, bottom line, he's talking about practicing for high passing shots. Or let's just say, because I don't want to encourage that, passing shots. I was thinking about it. I've seen a comment the other day recently. It doesn't happen as much as it did before, but all he said was, looks like a lot of passing shots to me. Okay, great observation. People, the same statements they make, man, you're smart. There's a lot of smart people out there. I'm so glad you observed that there was passing shots in one of our videos. And I got to thinking about it. It doesn't bug me when people say things like that. What bugs me is the stupidity of that comment because where at in anything is it wrong to shoot passing shots? I don't know what that is about social media, about the arrogance of duck hunters that try to condemn other people for taking passing shots. If you're shooting birds way out of range and you're blown through a box of shells and you ain't knocking down. That's not, that's not right. That's not ethical. You're putting pellets and birds. They're not dropping. I am not saying to do that. What I am saying though, is it is not wrong. Do not let people condemn you. Do you want them in the decoys? Do you want your spread right? Do you want to be a better caller? But you cannot be lazy when it comes to those things because like, well, I'm just going to shoot passing shots. I'm going to shoot birds just passing by. I'm not saying that. I'm not condoning that. But when you've done your spread and you've done your calling and you've tried to become a better caller and you practice, 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 you do everything in your power and maybe they're just not settling in, but they cross in front of you. Those same guys that say passing shots are wrong and a bird crosses in front of you from left to right at 20 yards those same guys will shoot that bird. Why is do, is that any different, any better from one that is going from behind you away at 30 yards shooting it or going at you and keeps going? It's no different. And I'm not trying to cover for us and what we do. I'm saying in general, the majority of duck hunters are going to shoot passing birds. I've shot plenty of birds in the decoys. I've shot plenty of birds back puddling. I've done it. I've done both sides. My standard is I'm not going to not shoot because they're not landing in my decoys. I'm not, that's not me. I don't, there's times I passed on it. like, yeah, I don't want to take that shot. And then passing, you know, I'll, I'll let something work. If birds are working, I'm going to let them work. And if some pass by, yeah, let's let it go. But I just wanted to, I, I probably said too much of my own thoughts about it. But I just wanted to read that, and you can chew on that for a while. Anybody listening to this, chew on that for a little while. Set your own standard. Be ethical. If you want to take passing shots, take passing shots. If you want to not shoot and let them only land the decoys and walk away with a couple birds, by all means, do that. I think that's great, honestly. I highly recommend that, and I push for that, for people to do that. I think that's great. But... It's really none of my business to tell you what you should do and if you're wrong or right and how you do it. It's none of your business telling me that. 
Now, in my situation, it's a little bit different. I say that, but in my situation, it's different because I'm putting on the internet for other people to see. So you're going to get that. But I've been with enough people that say they don't do this, they don't do that. And when you get out in the field with them, boy, things sure go out the window and you're like, hmm, I thought you didn't take those kind of shots. I thought you didn't do this. Things really change. People's concept of what they really do is really different than what they say. And it's because it's their perception, right? And I think that too, like saying Kirk McCullough not taking passing shots, I'm curious to see what his idea of not taking a passing shot is because I guarantee you there's still shots he'll take that I would consider a passing shot, but to him, that's not one, right? And it all depends if he's in the timber. Well, if you're in the timber and they break that treetop and they come in down there, that ain't, it's, they're done. There ain't no passing shot there because they crack the treetops. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be trimming the trees either, shooting birds crossing over the tops of the trees. I don't think that's right either. You know, in my opinion, I wouldn't do that. If the guys do that, that's what they do. Now, if he's hunting rice field or if he's hunting open water or if he's in the cattails, you know, may I could be wrong, but maybe, maybe Kirk's idea of pass shooting is not what I think he's talking about, right? It's all in perception. So let's not judge each other. Let's not be thinking we're better than somebody else. Even the rookiest of hunter that don't know anything has decoy birds. So it doesn't make us elitist. It just makes us more experienced. And if we choose not to take these kind of shots, more power to us. And we've been hunting longer, and that's okay. And that's how it should be. It should progress. But anyways, I thought that was interesting. 1965, practicing clays for passing shots. So it don't try to tell me old school. Let's not let's not blame the older gentlemen, the guys back in the day, our forefathers. Let's not blame them saying they're the ones that said that's a crime because they're right here in the Duck Hunter's Bible. They're practicing for those situations, but they're practicing also for layouts. They're pla- pra- practicing for decoying shots. As an all-around waterfowler, they want to be prepared for any situation. I respect that. So thanks for listening, guys. Hope you enjoy this. Probably do a part two of some more things out of this book. There's so many interesting old school things. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Share this podcast. Appreciate, appreciate your guys' support. We'll see you on the next one.